God loves you. Again, God loves you. I, I thought uh, this week a lot about what is the most important thing that I would want to pass on to the next generation of faith. And I've been thinking about this question a lot because this Easter season, we're having a, basically a baptism every week. And so I've been meeting with parents and godparents talking about what we want and, and actually teaching them the promises that they're going to make to raise the next generation, their child in faith. And as a congregation, this Easter season, we'll say a number of times that we promise to pray for new life and faith. So it's worth asking ourselves, what do we really want to pass on? And again, for me, it comes back to God loves you. And we could put that in terms of the 23rd Psalm, that, that he leads me beside still waters, that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, he makes me lie down in green pastures. We could put it in the words of, of the Gospel of John today, of Jesus, when Jesus says that he's the good shepherd and he lays down his life for us, that he's willing to die for us. Indeed, in the waters of baptism, I will claim this child as a beloved child of God. So, so we definitely have a, a sort of a celebration here of love today, of God's love for us. But it brings up the question, how, how do you pass on to the next generation that they're loved by God, right? Now, this seems like a pretty difficult thing. How do we get the next generation to come to know that they are loved by God? To get at that answer, I want to ask you another question. I want to ask, when in your life did you know for the first time that you were loved? When for the first time did you know you were loved? My sense is that I've actually asked an impossible question. Because most of you can't remember back far enough to remember when you were actually loved. For, for most of us, the, the people from whom we learned what love actually is were the people that held us, that fed us, that nursed us, the people that taught us how to ride a bike, the people that stood there in the pool and convinced us that it was okay to jump in, the people that stayed up late practicing science vocabulary only the next day to take our lunch because we had forgotten it, the people that were on the sidelines that were our coaches. Again, we, we know what, what love is, not really because of what any book or any poem we read in 11th grade or even really what the words of the Bible fully say. It's because at some level we were loved. We were loved by another person, likely our parents, our grandparents, our aunt, our uncle, maybe one day a child or a spouse. My sense is that the way in which we can help the next generation come to understand, come to comprehend that they are loved by God is to love them. Because you can't conceive of a loving God if you've never been loved yourself. Again, you can't really conceive of a loving God if you've never experienced love yourself. And so I remember when I had, um, when Emily and I had our first child, you know, we got the book, What to Expect When You're First Expecting. And we read it all, and then we got freaked out, and we read other books and got even more freaked out. So we finally put it down, we just held our child. What's interesting, though, just as an aside, there is no book like What to Expect in Your First Year of Having a Teenager because nobody was arrogant enough to write that book, <laughs> right? So again, but you get overwhelmed. But so the simple thing is, again, what we have to do is, as parents, grandparents, godparents, grand grandparents, great uncles, great aunts, Sunday school teachers, coaches, it's just about loving this next child, loving the next generation, because the only way you can ever even conceive of a loving God is if you've experienced love at some point in your life. The reality, though, is that at some point in our journey, no matter how much we were loved by our home, right, no matter how good of parents we have, there are going to be days in our life where we don't feel particularly lovable. Right? All of us will encounter a time in our life where we don't think that we're worthy of somebody else's love or love from anybody. I don't think this is a, a sign of mental unhealth. This is just a, a reality. We go through life and we encounter stuff. We, we realize we m mess up really badly. We hurt people we love or, or we internalize the, the negative things that other people say about us. We, we hit walls in life. There are, there's a table before us, but it's in the presence of our enemies who are, who are wearing us down. And so again, we, we all get to that point where we, we're not quite convinced that, that we're lovable. My sense is that this is where Scripture comes in. This is why we, we ask, we invite the promise of parents to, to 
teach the scriptures to their children, not that they'll know that God loves them, I think that is part of it, but that we'll know that God loves us even when we don't get it all right. And even when we don't feel particularly lovable, because that's story after story after story after story in the Bible of people who don't get it right. Every reason under the sun why humans shouldn't be loved, it's there in the Bible. Whether it's David, whether it's Peter, I mean, we could just go on and on and on and on in the names. And yet God finds a way in spite of the hardness of the human heart to love and to work through us. Recently, I've been watching The, the Chosen. I was, I was convinced to watch it, um, and I thought I wasn't going to like it, but I do. And uh, one of the, the cool things, and, and Emily and I were talking about this, is that one of the disciples, Matthew, is, is mildly autistic. And he doesn't make a lot of eye contact, and he's really socially awkward. And it's kind of interesting to think about this. And he struggles with, with thinking that other disciples are there for a reason, and he's not. And it's really this powerful thing, because it really gets at the heart of so many scripture stories, where, where again and again, people in the Bible, one moment they think they're better than everybody, and the next moment they realize that they're not worthy, kind of like us. Yet God works with them. And so my, my hope is that the, the children who would be baptized, the adults who would be baptized in this font, all of us would come to know this fundamental truth that we need to hear over and over and over again in our lives, that we are loved by God, loved enough that he sent his son to die for us and now sends his spirit that we might live in fellowship with each other. Like, this is the, the bedrock that I want every person, every person in contact with this ministry to know, that they are passionately, terrifyingly, unbelievably loved by God. That's what we want. But the other thing we want people to know, the other thing we want other people to know is it's not about you. Right? The first thing is, God loves you enough that he gave up everything for you. The second thing is, it's not about you. We can put this in, in terms of the, the 23rd Psalm. He leads me in paths, did we read this morning? He leads me in paths of self-actualization of the goals that I've set out for maximizing my health, wealth, and prosperity, and well-being, and reputation in the community for my sake. Is that what we read? And it's the 23rd Psalm. No matter what translation you use, he leads me in paths of righteousness. Righteousness is about relationship with other people and relationship with our creator. He leads me in paths of right conduct for the sake of relationship, for the sake of other people, and for the sake of our relationship with God, for his name's sake, for his reputation's sake, not for ours. To put this in the words of baptism, the words that we hear in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Again, God loves you fiercely, but it's fundamentally not just about you. Hmm. There was a picture on Facebook recently that a mom in the church put up, and it showed her son on, on first base. I guess he got a hit. It's great. And it said the family's name on the back. And I imagine there was a lot of pride seeing the name out there on the field. And I know this happens as parents, right? Or, you know, you go to a show of a relative or of a friend, and who do you look for in all the programs? Do you look who has the leads? No. You want to find the name of the family that you're there with, right? Oh, yeah, that's, that's my friend's child, right? So, so you want that. And, and what happens then is that what, that what that child or what that person does seems to reflect on others, and you kind of can't escape that connection. That's true for God as well. It turns out that, that God has hitched God's reputation to our conduct. Again, God has hitched God's name and reputation to our conduct. What we do isn't just about us. It makes a statement about who our God is. This week, I was talking to somebody who was really frustrated about what's going on in, in school board. And, and school board is always messy because it involves children, and it involves tax money, and it involves community values and Friday night football. I mean, it, it, it gets everybody involved in town all wrapped up. But this person said, you know, you know I just don't even, I don't even want to be associated with the name Christian anymore because the way that the people who are saying they're Christian are acting, I just find so mean and cruel. Now, again, we, we can't, <laughs> other people will judge us and not understand us, but it's just a, a humbling reminder that, that what we do isn't just about us. 
It impacts our neighbor. It impacts our neighbor's faith. It impacts their relationship with God. So again, bedrock, bedrock conviction is God loves you. (laughs) But right after that, it's not just about you. And this is something that we need to learn in life. And I'm curious, when in your life did you realize that it wasn't just about you? I think we all have those various experiences. For me, one of the, the profound moments, a, a light bulb going off, was uh, it was my freshman year of college, and my dad called me up, and he said, Rob, you need to get a job. And I said, oh, I'll get a job. He's like, no, you need to get a job. I'm like, I'll get one, I'll get one. A week later, Rob, have you gotten a job? No, no, uh, either you get one or I get one for you. Well, he got me one. So that summer, I was, uh, I was landscaping. I said, I can landscape, I can mow lawns. Uh, but anyway, so anyway, so I, I show up, and what happens is, is that the, the man who uh, owned the small business was a man named Joe. I'll protect his last name for, uh, for his sake. Um, but Joe had this view that basically my time was his money, and that if I was wasting my time, I was wasting his money. He was a hawk. And he would just kind of sneak up behind you, make sure you were putting the fertilizer right in all of the greenhouse. And man, it was like when he showed up on a job, I learned real quick how to look like I was busy even if I wasn't, right? I mean, he was just, he was at it. Well, by the end of the summer, what I had this realization was that I was going to get to go back to college. And a lot of the guys that I was working with, they weren't. And it was one of those moments of like, wow, like I, I get, I get to like, go to college. I have this opportunity. I have this this opportunity to do something. And I'll tell you, I would have crawled back to school that sophomore year. I I, I would have crawled back backwards. And I was so thankful. I, I focused so hard on my studies that semester because I had this renewed sense that I had been given this opportunity and that I had to do something with it for the sake of others. Because again, I had been given so much to have this opportunity. Again, in life, we, we have those, those moments where we, we get it that it's not just about us. Okay. Now, I wish I could tell you at age 20, I had that realization, and I've been on autopilot since. We need to be reminded again and again, right? Okay. So, two years ago, I started coaching uh, cross-country. And it turns out that running every day I was getting a little bit faster. And before this, I never timed myself. I just went out and I practiced my sermons. But by the end of the cross-country season, I was like, you know, I'm getting faster with my times. Like, I mean, I'm running, I'm racing every day. I think you know, maybe, I could, maybe I could run a race, you know? There's a, maybe I could catch up with Rick Marinak and the other fast guys in the church. I could, I could do this, right? Well, uh, that winter, I developed plantar fasciitis which is where there's an inflammation in your heel. Basically, my leg is too uptight. But here's the funny thing. I can still run far, and I can still run slow. I just can't run fast. I can still practice my sermons, and I can still run all day with middle schoolers. I just can't race. A lot of times in life, what we discover is that when there's obstacles that come, we don't want to hear it from our friends, but later we can look back and we can see that the Lord's rod and staff are well, comforting us. They're leading us back and reminding us that it's not just about us, that there's other things we're asked to live for, other things we're set free to to live for. These are these two fundamental realizations of life, I think, of being a disciple, that God loves you intently and that your life isn't just about you. Today we have a baptism of a child, and I want to say that I'm It's not so much that I believe in infant baptism. It's more just that I believe in lifelong discipleship. That I think that the whole life of one, the whole life of one is is learning anew that we're loved by God, often in spite of ourselves. And furthermore, that we have a, a calling, an obligation to love and to serve our neighbor for the path of righteousness and for the Lord's namesake. I want to end with a story, though, that kind of brings this, um, this together. So that summer that I was uh, landscaping, the summer was coming to an end, and I was counting down the days till I sort of was, was no longer working for Joe. And um, he was off that week, which meant, of course, as workers, we were very happy. We were still working hard, but it was a, it was a good week because he was taking, he was off. 
And um, it was Friday, and we're all getting ready. And so I was the, the least skilled of all the workers, and they, so they said to me, Rob, we want to get out of here. Go fill up the car so that we can get out of here then as soon as the shift is over. All right, okay. So I go over, fill up, the, fill up the pickup truck, and come back, and, like, it's really starting to shake. And I get back, and I'm like, guys, something's not right with the truck. It's just, it's kind of shaky. And uh, one of the guys looks at me and says, well, what'd you put in it? And I said, gas. He's like, did you put diesel in it? And I said, no. <laughs> okay, so for those that don't know, you don't put gas in a diesel engine. <laughs> it's not good for the engine. So, uh, so it's Friday. We, we end up like towed. We end up putting it on. And we get it, we get it back to the shop. And all weekend now, I'm sitting there with this realization that like the cost of an engine repair is basically equal to the wages I made all summer. It's so, like I literally worked all summer to put gas in a diesel engine. And I'm like, oh, man, this is so bad. So I'm like <laughs> totally stressed about this. And uh, so, so it's Monday, and it's, it's work. And, and Joe waits all day, and he comes up to me. says, Rob. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you, uh, you did pretty well in high school, didn't you? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. You go to a pretty fancy college, don't you? I'm like... Just, just tell me what I owe you, man, right? He's like, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And you put, you put gasoline in a diesel engine. I'm like, yes, yes, I did. And I'm like, oh, just, you know. And then he says to me, we all make mistakes, don't worry about it. And uh, the week before, he had gone on a trip with my church where he had done rehab work for people whose houses had been damaged in a flood. And I mean, he got it that week that it wasn't about him. And so he was able to pass that on to me and say, it's okay. It's okay. And so that was just one of those moments, again, of, of realizing, hey, it's, <laughs> he had the moment of it's not about him, and I had the moment of, okay, I feel loved. This really is our life, though, the life that we have as a disciple, where again and again we discover this fundamental truth that often in spite of ourselves that the Lord leads us beside still waters and, and makes us lie down in green pastures but again and again calls us into paths of righteousness for his name's sake because it's finally about Christ and the call to serve him and not about ourselves. Amen.